I see skies blue and clouds of white, the bright blessed day and the dark sacred night. Think to myself, what a wonderful world. Here's author and international entrepreneur Jack Nadell. Out of the Box is about people who live interesting lives and are giving back to the community. Jack Canfield is the co-author of Chicken Soup for the Soul and co-founder of the Chicken Soup Conglomerate. Since the publication of the first Chicken Soup book, an entire industry has grown up around this inspirational and motivational concept. With some 40 million books in print and numerous seminars, the chicken soup phenomenon has burst on the public imagination like a thousand rockets on the 4th of July. I am delighted to have as our guest today, Jack Canfield. Jack, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to have you here. My pleasure. I expect Jack. to be thoroughly inspired at the end of the <laughs> half hour. I may walk away and feel wonderful. Uh, Jack, you built this thing. I mean, from you and Mark Hansen, mm -hmm. came together, created a title, it created a book first, I think. Yes. And then the title. Tell us, how did it happen? Well, it came about as a result of us being motivational speakers, and people kept coming up after talks and saying, you know that story about that puppy you told? Is that in a book anywhere? Or that story about the Girl Scout who sold 32,000 boxes of Girl Scout cookies? Is that in a book anywhere? I want my daughter to read that. We'd always have to say no. And so finally one day, you know, thud comes to dawn, like I should have had a V8. Sure. You know, yeah. it's like, hey, I'm supposed to write this book. So Mark and I put the stories together into a book, and then we had the wonderful uh, experience of no one wanting to buy the book. We were actually turned down by over uh, 140 publishers in New York and all around the country. You may have hit the record. <laughs> well, I, I think maybe we did. You know, I know that uh, the movie MASH, the book was turned down by 22 yeah. publishers, Jonathan Livingston Seagull by 60 publishers. So we were inspired. We had good people ahead of us that had <laughs> been rejected as many times as we had. So we were, we were excited to go out there and, and, and really push this book out into the world. And what we didn't realize was in the back of the first book, we, put a, we had an extra page. The publisher said, you have an extra page. You want to put anything in there? We said, well, how about if you have a story, send it in. Maybe we'll do a sequel. And little do we know what we would unleash. We now get 50 to 200 stories a day in the mail, on the email, on the fax machine. And so we have at this moment in time, Jack, there are 21 books in print. There's 40 million copies sold worldwide. We have about eight books a year that we're planning to publish for the next 10 years. So we, there's no end of stories out there. I'd like to add, latch on to something you said. The word is story. Mm -hmm. People love stories. Right. They, they, you know, you can start giving instruction, you can tell them rules and regulations, but it's the stories that they remember. That's right. And your stories are particularly all human. It's chicken soup. <laughs> right, right, right. No, it's true. We get letters from parents saying, you know, I try to give my kids instructions on how to be, live and so forth, and they don't listen. But when I read them a story from Chicken Soup for the Soul, which has all those principles in it, they listen and they remember and we talk about sure. it and they start to impart it in their lives. Sure. How did you get started in this? I know, was Chicken Soup for the Soul your first book? No, I actually wrote three books for teachers. I was a teacher and a teacher trainer and I wrote a book called How to Enhance Self-Concept in the Classroom. And then I wrote a book on self-esteem and responsibility in the classroom. And then finally a curriculum of activities for teachers. And then this was the first book for the general public. Where did you get started? You, what was your background? In other words, I, I know you were a motivational speaker. Mm -hmm. And in order to be a motivational speaker, you have to have had some background, some training. Well, now, where I, did that come from? I was a kid who was not real motivated. My, my father was a, an alcoholic and a little bit abusive, and so I was one of those people Is there who, such a thing as a little bit abusive? <laughs> <laughs> well, more verbally than physically, okay. although a little bit of physical. But I think for, for me, I needed to go through therapy and find myself, and then I wanted to turn around and share what I'd found with others. And I, in the process, I ran across a man named W. Clement Stone, who was a self-made multimillionaire. He was worth $600 million, and he'd started out on the streets of Chicago as a shoeshine boy and a newspaper salesman. And uh, he literally had all the principles of success. And I said, I want to learn those. And so I worked for him for two years and literally learned about the importance of setting goals, the importance of visualizing your dreams, the importance of networking, taking action, asking for what you want, and so forth. These were things my dad never taught me. And unless you grew up in, in an upward mobile or upper, upper class home, you never learned these principles. And so I was able to study at the feet of a master for two years. And that's where I really kind of transformed my life. Well, it sounds like you took this therapy experience and expanded it 
So, you know, just like we, we say in advertising, uh, you know, sales is one on one advertising. You're selling millions of people. That's right. So isn't that the same thing with, with what you've done? Well, taking it's the true. With, therapeutic with principles? therapy, you have one person in your office or maybe a couple and you reach one or two people and then, you know, maybe eight people a day if you're lucky. And I had this need to reach more people. Yes. And so I found that by talking, I could talk to a thousand people at a conference. But then I realized that I could read, write a book and reach millions of people. And then right. by doing television like this, we reach hundreds of thousands and millions. So really, uh, you, I, I'm, Mark and I call ourselves an information utility. We just want to reach as many people <laughs> as we can through as many media as possible. And uh, you know, right now we're working on a chicken soup for the uh, Seoul television program with Vin Bona, the publisher, or the producer of America's Funniest Home Videos. And they're selling this to Paxnet, which is a cable channel. And what's happening, we're realizing that only one out of seven people in America ever go into a bookstore to read a book. Mm -hmm. So even if our books were totally reaching everybody, there'd still be six out of seven people who hadn't read us. So the TV is the way to reach the rest of them. But you've done something really remarkable. The first Chicken Soup book, as I understand it, was published in 1993. Correct. So we're talking six years. Right. And what you've done is you've established a franchise, a brand name. Yes. And the brand name is Chicken Soup. Right. Now, I'd like to know how many people told you when you came up with that title, are you crazy? <laughs> well, every, every publisher in New York said it was a stupid title. Right. No one would buy it. No one would understand it. And that uh, nobody bought short stories because they weren't that interesting, you know, and, and there was no sex, no violence. This would never work. And, uh, you know, here we are 40 million books later, a TV show. We've sold uh, the rights to a Chicken Soup for the Soul game, Chicken Soup for the Soul doll collection. You know, it's ridiculous. But what it is is that people are feeling connected to the warmth, the love, the, the, the joy, the, the perseverance, the overcoming obstacles, all these qualities that are captured in the stories, and they want to be part of it. They want to connect to it. But you jumped out of the box, and you did something different. Yes. And you had the guts to follow through in the face of rejection. Right. In the face of, and I think this is one thing I'd like to pass on to the viewers, if we pass nothing else on, mm -hmm. that if someone says, no, it's not gonna work, he or she is not the last word. Right, that's correct. <laughs> what, what I say when someone says no, or you're stupid, or that'll never work, is I say thank you for your point of view. Because <laughs> they think they're contributing to you, sure, they're not trying sure. to shut you down. And, uh, and, and you move on, you know, but the point is it only takes one person to say yes to yeah. have your whole life work. And it took one publisher down in Florida, a little tiny publisher, no one ever heard of Health Communications. They hear of them now. Yeah, that's right, <laughs> to say yes. And we would have self-published if we had to, because we knew, because we were giving these speeches every day and people were saying, wow, that was a great talk, we love those stories. And the publishers in New York, you know, they're all looking for something that's already worked. Then they were sure. looking for the next Jane Fonda videotape, because right. that's what right. we're selling, you know. Right, but, but you, you created your own idiom. That's which right. Which I think is the and most important thing. And now, what's thing. really interesting in New York, people say, well, is this chicken soup like? <laughs> they, they refer to us as like a success <laughs> phenomenon. They want, we've had like three, um, what do you call them, satires, uh, where people have said, uh, you know, there's one called chicken poop in my bowl. <laughs> and, uh, and then we've had all kind of knockoffs that have come out, you know, God's uh, vitamin C for the spirits, a whole series of books of, of, of stories. So we've created, in a sense, a new genre within the American book publishing industry. Well, the underlying theme of Chicken Soup, as I, as I gather, is motivation. Well, it's motivation, they, it's opening your heart and opening your, your uh, what should we say, that enthusiasm that says, I can do it, I can do anything. You know, if this guy did it, I can do it. Right. So it's really like, it's love and success. It's not one or the other. Well, that really applies to so many areas that maybe even you have not thought about because when I started in business I, I put together a company that was based on commission mm -hmm. so I figured if, if we had salespeople and they made a commission the fact they made the commission was enough motivation and someone came to me and said why don't we have a contest so we can see you know we can really motivate everybody I said but they all make you know the more they sell the more they make and they said no and you know I was wrong I know I was wrong I really didn't realize it to the point that we have these motivational programs all the time. There's a select number of people that are able to gain the right. upper echelons of the people company. People like to win. And they like to win. Right. And even when we publish the sales figures, they said, how can you do that? Because how, how will the person feel who's on the bottom of the list? I said, let them move to the top. 
Mm -hmm. Let them move to the top. You know what's really interesting, Jack? I, I, do, I still do a lot of motivational talks for corporations, and I was working for a company that manufactures half the glass lenses for eyeglasses in the world. And uh, so, you know, they, they've got 50% market share. They're, they're not too yeah. aggressive, you know, but they're out there, and they wanted to. So I was the first motivational speaker they ever hired. At their, at their, so I got there, and I asked everyone. I was playing golf with a bunch of people, and I said, you know who the top three people in the company are in terms of sales? Well, everyone knew it was, it was Jack and Margie and Joe. And, and I, so I, I got this clearly. Everyone knew who it was. So I, at the talk, I said, there were 300 salespeople. I said, how many of you know uh, who the top three salespeople are? And everyone said, oh, yeah, Jack, Margie, and Joe. Then I said, how many of you have ever gone up to them and asked them what is it that they do yes. that you're not doing so you can do it so you can become one of the number one people? Only one hand out of 300 went up. I thought, isn't that a tragedy that we know where the information is, but we won't take advantage of it. We're so afraid of rejection. They're going to not want to tell us. They're going to make us look stupid, etc. You know, I go to do talks and say, people come up and say, well, my kid has this problem. I say, how long has he had the problem? Two years. I said, have you ever been to the bookstore to see if there was a book about it? Have you ever been to the library? No, it didn't occur to me. I mean, the answers are all out there. That's Today, what's so amazing. Today, specifically, on the internet, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you get the answer to anything. The information's there, but people won't take the time to connect the dots. There's nothing anyone wants to do that hasn't been already done by somebody successfully. You know, whether you want to buy real estate with no money down, you want to raise the healthy child, you want to start your own business, you want to lose weight, it's all been done. Information's there. You just have to go out and find it and do it. So you really become the channeler of that information. Well, you? that's what we've tried to do is take that information and put it in a form that's palatable to people. It's kind of like we've taken the pill and hid it in the, in the applesauce so the kid <laughs> doesn't know sugar. it's there. Yeah, exactly. And uh, because, again, you know, Christ knew this, Muhammad knew this, Buddha knew this. All the great storytellers, all the great spiritual teachers were storytellers. Absolutely. And, and people remember the stories, remember the parables of Jesus. You know, Ross Perot, I, I wasn't totally into his politics, but he, he was engaging because he always told stories during his right, campaign talks. Right. And I remembered all the stories. Maybe someone ought to talk to Al Gore. Someone ought to do that. <laughs> Uh, you, you started as a motivational speaker, and at that time, no one knew who Jack Canfield was. That's how correct. did you build your audience? Well, and, I and, always and how did it feel when you stand up finally in front of a group of people who are challenging you? Mm -hmm. You know, teach me something. What mm -hmm. are you going to do that's going to make my life better? Well, first, you have to know something that really works. So I never tried to teach anything that didn't work in my own life and that didn't work in the lives of others. So I, I did a lot of research, so I knew it, w it worked. Uh, my largest talk was 12,000 people to the American Dental Association. And I followed Bill Cosby, so I felt, hey, this is pretty cool, <laughs> you know. Uh, but I started with, with classrooms of uh, high school kids. I started with little groups of 10 people at the church on a Sunday. I, I started with uh, free talks for the Kiwanis and the Rotary. I always said if you wouldn't do it for free, you shouldn't get paid for it. You've got to love right. it enough that you do it no matter what. And then if you do that, you get good and you get feedback and you improve and you get better. Are you trying to tell me that you're not perfect the first time out of the box? I never was. <laughs> I don't think anyone. <laughs> Nobody ever. ever has been. It's like telling a child, stand up now, walk. You know, they yeah. fall down a lot, and they're going to yeah. do that for a lot before they do walk. So before you can deem to be an expert, you have to have been out there and put out and shown what you can do. Exactly. You have books on how to be a successful entrepreneur, and the only reason you could write that is because you were one. That's right. And the only reason I can write about self-esteem and education and how to enhance kids' self-esteem is I was a teacher and I was successful and I did it and I learned from my mistakes. And, uh, you know, that's the, the, the best teacher's experience. A lot of the parents out there could write a better book on parenting than a lot of the experts who write them because they know from their experience what, they, what they've learned. Well, but what you've done now is, is, is you've put out an entire series and so many people stop at the first success and say, gee, that's terrific. I never expected to be a published author or have my books on the shelf. Mm -hmm. But then you took that success and you pyramided that. And I think this is a lesson that a lot of people can learn. If it's successful one place or in one arena, it can move to another, it's portable. That's right, that's right. And, and I think that the principles of success from one industry apply to any industry. The, the, the specifics may be different, but the principles are universal. And that's what makes a chicken soup story work, is that whether it's a 15-year-old, a 30-year-old, a 70-year-old, American, Chinese, the principle's universal because it's based in love and perseverance and goal setting and overcoming obstacles, etc. And I think the other reason we've been successful is that we've always given back. We're big believers in tithing. And as you know, because we talked about this earlier before, 
before the show, we've given away millions of dollars. Every book we do, 20, to 50, uh, 20 cents to 50 cents of every book goes to charity. And we've always tried to do something that was meaningful that would give back to the community. And as a result, the community then supports you back. I believe that God supports your work that way. For example, a book that's just coming out this week, a, 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 a sixth portion of Chicken Soup for the Bowl, uh, for the soul. The soul. <laughs> <laughs> Chicken okay. Soup for the Bowl, that works. Uh, we're giving uh, money to Calm, which is a local Santa Barbara charity to prevent child abuse, the Santa Barbara Community College, and where my co-author works down in Orange County, the YMCA. So by doing that, we feel that it, it keeps the energy flowing. It doesn't get stuck. We're not trying to be greedy. We're trying to steward this, this, this wealth for the good of, the, of humanity, not just for ourselves. And I think because of that, I've always felt that everything we did was inspired by God. And, and Mother Teresa had a wonderful quote. She said, I'm only a pencil in the hand of God. And I like to think we're only a word processor or a computer in the hand of God. It's not just our little egos that are doing this. We couldn't do this. We're, we've reached 181 countries with our books. But it's something that we've aligned with and we're entrusted to. Well, it's hard for anybody to know where it comes from, whether mm -hmm. it comes from God or it comes from a spirit within yourself or it comes from your genes or mm -hmm. whatever it is. But the, the results are what we do know. And the, and the fact that you give back, mm -hmm. this is really the theme of Out of the Box. It says, yes. it says you have not, not you should, you have an obligation. You took so much out of this community. You learned. You went to this public school system. Mm -hmm. You went to this college. Uh, you went to this instructor. Give back. Right. Give back. Not give back of your knowledge. Give back of your money. And give back of your time. And this is what you're doing. I, I know you've given a, mm -hmm. a lot of free, and you command big bucks That's true. on that stage. When you spoke to the 12,000 dentists, I, like, I always want to say the dentists are drilling, but I won't. Uh, you got big bucks for that. Mm -hmm. You got big bucks. You were hired by an association. Mm -hmm. You had a big name, and you had an attraction. But at the same time, I know you'll go to a school here. That's right. And you won't get paid zip. You'll pay, you will be paid zip. You'll, you'll be, no, no remuneration at all except the satisfaction. So this is why I was particularly eager to have you here because with success goes obligation. Well, I believe that. And I think also with giving comes success, that it's, it's a circle. You can't right. take in right. and not give out. It's like, I mean, you know, we call that constipated if we do with our body. <laughs> and I believe that you can constipate the flow of, of material energy, you know, money, uh, by also hoarding it and holding on to it. Uh, one of the things that we're doing, for example, is on tax day here in Santa Barbara and in 10 other cities, we're giving away free chicken soup for the soul books from 3 o'clock to 4 o'clock. Anyone who shows up at the Anna Kappa post office to throw in their tax return, we're going to give away a free chicken soup for the soul book. Partly we need the publicity and we want to do that, but even more so, we want to give back to people when they're in a time of stress and under you know, that kind of pressure and so forth. So we're always finding some way to have fun to do something neat for the community. Well, you get, you get, you get big dividends. You, you get do. big dividends. Not only do you do the books, you're doing, you're doing tapes, you're doing, you're doing a, uh, audio and video. Right. Uh, and all of it is available out there. Uh, tell me, uh, now that you're famous, <laughs> <laughs> as opposed to when you were just Jack. Right. Now that you're Mr. Chicken Soup, how does it feel when people come up to you and, and tell you of their experiences, of what your books or your seminar or your tape, uh, what is it, what oh, it's done for it. them? I, no, I love it. We, we've had prisoners tell me that the reason they're out of jail and their lives are working is because three years ago their sister gave them a copy of Chicken Soup for the Soul. And they started reading it and they, they realized, you know, I'm the reason I'm in jail. It's not society's fault. I'm not a victim. I chose wrong choices and I can change. We've got kids who are dyslexic, who never read, who read Chicken Soup for the Soul books. We've got kids in, in, in lockups, in, in like here, right here in Santa Barbara, in, in institutions, uh, correctional facilities for kids. The only thing they'll read is Chicken Soup for the Teenage Soul. So, you know, I sleep really well. I know that, 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 that what I've done has made a difference and it, it, it warms my heart, you know. And the other thing is, is it, part of me is almost, I can't believe it. You know, it's just yeah. like so overwhelming. Is this me? Is yeah. this me? Yeah. You know, when, when are they going to wake up and find out who I really am? <laughs> <laughs> well, the truth but, is, I'm just another guy like everybody else. But you see, also, uh, I came against, uh, I came up to your name because we've been involved with the D.A.R.E. organization, mm -hmm. Drug Abuse International, right. doing great things for kids who are at risk. And I found that you were giving free lectures. Right. 
to the to to, to the, the dare, dare classes, officers, to the right. dare officers who give the right. which is even more important because right. you're teaching the teachers. Right. Because these are police officers who now have to stand up in front of a group of kids and convince them right. that drugs are the wrong way to go. And there you were teaching the teachers. What was that experience like? Well, my, you know, the first minute or so, I was a little nervous myself. I don't know, something about police officers. You know, it's like you've been pulled over for speeding. You yeah. know, and here's a whole room what, full me? of them. So it's a little intimidating. But uh, after a few minutes, you know, police officers are human beings like everybody else. These, these are the best officers in terms of sensitivity. They care about kids. They want to give back to the community. I found them to be, you know, just as sensitive as any other teacher I'd ever met that was a professional educator. And we had a great time. You know, all they wanted was information on how to be effective so they could do their job. And I had some I could share with them. Don't you find now in all your experiences that most people that you meet are interested in doing a better job? Everybody. Are interested in improving themselves? Yeah. I know when I was doing promotions for my business books, there was always someone in the booth who said, gee, could you stay a while? I have a business on the side and I wonder how I can get the financing for it or whatever, whatever was needed. Mm -hmm. and, and you find that you're giving out this knowledge all the time that you've built up and right. uh, and the interesting part, and I don't know, have you done anything internationally? Yes, no, I've, I've spoken in 19 countries, uh, China, Australia, Japan, um, where else, Thailand, India. That was fun. Yeah, India I mean, was really interesting. You have a world of chicken soup eaters, yeah, huh? Yeah, Well, in India, it's a vegetarian country. You know, they don't eat the cows and so forth. Right. So they're all going, oh, we cannot call it chicken soup for the soul. <laughs> we must call it rasam. It's an herb uh, that everyone yeah. takes, you know. But it's the same idea that it's the elixir that heals you when you're, when you're sick. But when I was in India, what was really happened that was fun is we came out of there with a project called Chicken Soup for the Indian Soul. And now what we're doing is with Sheree Carter Scott, who's a motivational speaker here in town as well, uh, doing a book, Chicken Soup for the Global Soul. So every story will be from a different country to show how everyone, whether it's a mother in Paris, France, or a mother in Paris, Texas, they want the same thing for their kids. Okay, that's the point I was trying to bring yeah. out. The people are people wherever you go. Absolutely. They all have the same hopes and aspirations would like to succeed, would like to take care of their kids, would like to do all the good things. Absolutely. But sometimes circumstances don't, does not allow them to do that. Uh, did you find in your experience also, and this I found very interesting, someone who came from nowhere, mm -hmm. like Jack Canfield, I mean... I no came one, from West Virginia, no that's one, real no, close no, to no nowhere. I prepared you for this. Uh, is so philanthropic, mm -hmm. is so philanthropic. And, and if you go outside of the United States, most countries, they believe that that's for the government to take care of. Mm -hmm. It's not up to me to take care of the education system. It's not up to me to take care of the poor. It's not up to me to do any. That's for the government. Have you found that to be the case? In I found that to be the case in some places, but not always. Uh, when I was in uh, India, uh, the reason I was brought there was a hospital uh, that was the first privately held hospital, because all the hospitals in India are generally government. And this was a person who was a doctor who was losing heart attack patients because they were flying them to the United States for the best care, etc. But often they wouldn't make it. He said, we have to have emergency care here. And he hired me to come in and do three talks across India and Delhi and Bombay and Calcutta to raise funds so that they could provide cancer treatment to the poor. So we raised over, I think about $120,000 in U.S. funds uh, to provide cancer treatment to the poor. And this was an Indian doctor who was doing this. So I think philanthropy is alive and well all throughout the world, but I think we probably, in America, probably there's a greater percentage of us that participate. Uh, I, I, it was very interesting, I just, a story I just edited, so I'll share this with you about okay. philanthropy. A church, uh, all these people were at church and they said we have a poor family in the community and we're going to raise money and, and goods and we're going to bring these to the people and so everyone got together in this one poor family and they all took a little less that week and they created a box for the, the family. They took it to church only to find out later that day that everything was delivered to their house. They were uh, upset by this quite frankly because we're not poor. I mean we, we how come we be the poor family? Anyway, they had $70 now. So they went to church next Sunday, a little bit embarrassed because this had happened, and, but at the same time, you know, took the $70. And there was a missionary from Africa who was there saying there was a really difficult situation. They needed to build a hospital there. And could they raise some money? And they passed the basket through the church. And this family took their entire $70 and put it in the basket. And at the end, they had gathered $80. And this family sat there and said, now who's the poor family in this church? <laughs> it's a good story. Mm -hmm. Uh, getting back to, to the whole chicken soup series, mm -hmm. you know, now I see you're doing chicken soup for the pet lover. Yes. Uh, chicken soup for the entrepreneur. That's correct. 
Is that completed? It's about three quarters done, Chicken Soup for the Entrepreneur Soul. And it's a wonderful book because entrepreneurs, as you know, are people with a dream who don't let the dream die. They just keep going until they achieve it. And so we've got stories in there about, you know, people that started Pepperidge Farms. There was a woman who in her kitchen started baking whole wheat bread because her son was asthmatic and the white bread wasn't good for him. And the neighbor started saying, well, your kid's sandwiches taste better than ours. And the kids would go home and say, mom, will you make sandwiches on that bread? And pretty soon she was selling them to the local grocery store. And now they have 600 employees worldwide. You know, it's like those kind of stories out of out of someone's desire to make a difference, not because she wanted to make a lot of money, but because she wanted to bring healthier bread into the planet. Well, you get a hundred of those stories, by the time you finish that book, you're so inspired you can't see straight. Well, are you, wouldn't you say then that a great deal of the Chicken Soup series is a, a, a takeoff on Reader's Digest? Yes. Except that it's focused. Yes. Focused to a specific well, you know, I used, to, I used to subscribe to Reader's Digest, still do, because I love the stories. And, but there was always five or six stories that were my favorite stories. There was always one like the person who left the greatest impression on me. There was some inspirational story, some guy who had survived in a car underwater for half an hour before he was rescued. And those were the best stories. I wasn't interested in the, you know, the economics and the philosophy and the, the international law and all that was in there. And so what we did really was take those human interest stories, if you will, and make that like in a sense, a whole Reader's Digest type book. That wasn't what we were thinking at the time, but that's really what we in effect did. Well, but now that you've done this and you've done this in all these specialized books and done the tapes and done the seminars, where do you go from here? Well, I think we've got, as I mentioned earlier, we have at least 80 more chicken soup books that we want to do. 80 more? 80, yeah. Chicken soup for the divorced soul, the grandparent soul, the man's soul, the college student soul, the golfer's soul, the horse lover soul. I mean. There's a hundred stories that are inspiring in every one of those areas. Doctor's soul, nurse's soul, but why not? So uh, that's what we want to do. And I think more than that, well, we're now we're starting a chicken soup for the soul foundation because we are making so much money. We want to become more um, strategic in our giving. For example, yes. if you give $10 for a cataract operation in a third world country, you take a person who couldn't make a living, who can now support his whole family for $10. That's a pretty heavy leverage. So we're trying to begin to explore where can we have the most leverage like that. Well, pretty soon you'll have a very big organization between uh, among all the various chicken soups and the foundation and the decisions that you have to make. Mm -hmm. Give me, if you will, a, uh, a, pa a paragraph. What is chicken soup? Well, we have a little saying that, that uh, the purpose of chicken soup for the soul is that we're changing the world for the better one story at a time. Nowhere is it more important to get out of the box than in the world of business. Immediately after World War II, the fashion industry was centered in Paris. Every year, buyers came from all over the world. Along with the high-priced stores came those that catered to the more popular-priced masses. They would copy the styles and sell them at a fraction of the original cost. Pierre Cardin came out of the box with the idea that he would manufacture a line of clothing that directly knocked off his own high-priced designs. The other fashion designers condemned Cardin for departing from tradition. They did not realize he had started a whole new industry in ready-to-wear with original fashion designs at popular prices. Instead of being insulted, Pierre Cardin achieved greater fame and wealth as he laughed all the way to the bank. What a wonderful world. I see skies blue and clouds of white. The bright blessed day and the dark sacred night. I think to myself, what a wonderful world.